will come back. I think everyone is in. All right. Yep. Okay, so uh, Mike, uh, can we continue with the two presentations? Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, welcome back, everybody. John, you're on. John's going to speak about the American experience. Unmute, unmute yourself, John. There you yeah, go. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Nope. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm John Stauffer with the America Team for Displaced Eritreans. And, and we're a U.S.-based NGO that works exclusively for the benefit of Eritreans. <clears throat> I'll summarize our mission and activities and then the basics of our interactions with the, uh, with the U.S. government and some of the uh, successes we've had and, and a few frustrations and limitations we've faced. The primary focus of the America team is helping Eritrean refugees and asylum seekers, both for individual cases and uh, at a macro governmental policy level. So we're, we're the principal uh, American NGO that does that. And, and, and like, like some other NGOs in the U.S., we also advocate for human rights in Eritrea. So how, you know, how, how did all this get started? Well, as Mike was saying back uh, in uh, 2003, I had been back in the United States for 35 years after uh, having taught in Adelaide. I invited a former student to, to come to see me in the United States for, for a six-month visit. And to my surprise, after his arrival, <laughs> he, he, he tossed his return plane ticket into the fire in my living room. And, and, and that's when I knew that there was a problem and that, that, that needed attention. So together, the two of us began working on it, and thus the America team was born. You know, first, we provided scholarships for refugees in, in camps in Ethiopia, and 34 Eritreans completed a three-year program in nursing in Addis Ababa. And the top student now works in a hospital, hospital in Pennsylvania. And we responded to needs in the camps, as, uh, such as assistance for the triplets born to uh, refugee parents in Shemelba camp. We soon began helping asylum seekers in the U.S., and I'll describe uh, that in, in, in a moment. We assisted refugees resettled in the United States and, and wrote a beginner's picture dictionary to help newcomers learn English. And as, as, as many refugees fled to Sudan, we worked with UNHCR to assist families. We sent cash assistance directly to individuals and, and assisted Dijin the MiG pilot in getting approval for resettlement. As refugees were being tortured and extorted for ransom in, in, in the Sinai, we raised awareness in the U.S. and we assisted with blankets and medication for released refugees put into detention in, in, in the detention center in, in Egypt. We assisted an Egyptian colleague who gathered information about the smuggling traffic and, and, and who helped bury the dead who had been dumped in the desert. As time went on, we assisted refugees who were able to contact us from many places, from over 25 countries in uh, Africa, uh, the Far East, uh, Eastern Europe, Latin America, and the Middle East. In many or most of these cases, we were able to, to, to save them from deportation, from illness, from destitution, or from physical injury. We have dozens of life and death stories, each one more dramatic than the next. Here are, here are a few examples. And for, for Russia and Ukraine, we assisted for many that were jailed there, men and women alike. And in Saudi Arabia, there were two pilots who stole SIS's plane, and the pilot who was sent to retrieve the plane also defected. So all, all three were resettled to save countries. In Vietnam, uh, a mother and child and her cousin who flew from Tel Aviv were stranded in Hanoi uh, when they lost their papers in a layover trip stop. Uh, the mom was pregnant 
and we covered delivery of the new baby boy in a Western hospital in Hanoi. And the family is now resettled in the United States. And in the, in the island nation of Seychelles, a young woman stranded by a, a smuggler was pregnant and, and we assisted for a full year. And, and tell me, it's very expensive in that place. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> uh, we, are, we are providing ongoing expenses now uh, for a large family in Uganda for rent and food and, and school registration. Uh, for 10 guys stuck in Yemen amidst, you know, the Civil War. And, and we're helping a football team now in all four teams that have defected. Three football and one bicycle racing. Assisting refugees in Libya, uh, getting releases from smugglers and from detention, and assisting with uh, providing shelter and protection for about 200 refugees, mostly Eritreans. In the U.S., several hundred Eritreans seek asylum every year. Many have fled through Sudan or Ethiopia, then through South America and Mexico to the southern border of the United States, where they, they have presented themselves to U.S. immigration officials. At that point, many have asked the America team for assistance, which we provide without charge. Examples are uh, testimony and evidence of Eritrea country conditions for asylum hearings, assistance preparing uh, requests for asylum, <clears throat> uh, help finding free, free of charge legal representation, and cash assistance for phone calls and postage and for transportation in the event that the, the person is released. In order to create awareness and concern about Eritrea, We've done interviews and consultations with magazines and other publications, and we've maintained our website, EritreanRefugees.org, with selected news and uh, background, which has helped journalists, lawyers, etc. And I would encourage all of you to, to check it out, EritreanRefugees.org. And we co-produced a one-hour uh, documentary, which has been screened in several countries. And I should add that Siegel played a key role uh, in that <clears throat> in that movie. Made it uh, really very interesting. I'm glad she's here, and and also Gebra Hawet, who was uh, very active behind the scenes. We've also intensely pursued dialogue with U.S. government off offices. For that, we've met many times with members of, of Congress and staff, and also with uh, pertinent offices of the U.S. State Department, that is, uh, bureaus covering uh, diplomacy, human rights, uh, refugee, uh, religious freedom, and refugees and migration. So our objectives with, the, with these contacts are, number one, to, to create awareness and concern about the human rights situation in Eritrea and the plight and needs of the refugees and more and better justice and protection for asylum seekers in the U.S., including seeking to stop the forced return of denied asylum, asylum seekers to, to Eritrea. Overall, I, I, I'd say our biggest successes have been five things. First, saving hundreds of individual refugees and asylum seekers from deportation, uh, illness, and sometimes, uh, sometimes death. Assisting one of our team members in, in his heroic work in protecting refugees seeking shelter and safety in Libya. Thirdly, uh, creating comfortable and durable relationships and lines of communication with numerous U.S. and U.N. officials in which they trust us as thoughtful, discreet, and, and reliable partners and who we believe sometimes take, take our suggestions. Number four, testifying before the U.S. Congress in a public hearing. And five, uh, Last year, our advocacy resulted directly in a formal letter from 43 members of the U.S. Congress to the government's immigration authorities challenging the government's efforts to force hundreds of denied uh, asylum seekers uh, to be returned to a horrible fate in Eritrea. 
and there, there there have been factors, frustrations, and challenges and challenges in meeting the, the these objectives. One is that Eritrea and its problems are simply not widely known in the United States, despite the best efforts of us and others. Other lar large refugee populations uh, needs have, have been taken have taken up uh, capacity for compassion in the public and the U.S. government. For example, the Rohingyas, Darfuris, and Syrians, and also massive and controversial migration into the U.S. from Latin America have dominated the news and the energy of pro-asylum activists. So try as we might, we have not succeeded in, en in enlisting a, a congressional. Occasional sparks of interest have not turned on, uh, turned into flames. Eritrea simply has not held the attention, attention of any member of Congress, at least in part for lack of a large, organized, and vocal Eritrean oppositionist constituency within any one congressional district. Challenging factors include distractions to Congress presented by uh, nothing but the impeachment of the president and by addressing the, the pandemic of COVID-19. Also, the current administration is, is uninterested in Africa and by its own acknowledgement is hostile towards immigration and especially refugees and asylum seekers, which chills the response of, of many in Congress as well. And now there's a distraction presented by the president seeking re-election. Happy day. Well, um, looking ahead, uh, you know, we're, we are a small organization. We work every day, round the clock on a volunteer basis. The work is pretty hard, but it's gratifying. And, and we would welcome the, the support of others, possibly some from this conference, if you feel you would like to help. With everyone else uh, at, at, at this conference, we must prepare to make requests of our respective governments if and when a more democratic Eritrea unfolds. Okay, thank you very much. And I look forward to, to sharing views on, on all of this with the other panelists and with the audience. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, John. Sarah, uh, I think uh, we're looking at uh, the following two uh, uh, forthcoming segments uh, of, the, of this discussion. One is having the panelists talk among one another for a while and then opening it up to everybody. Is, is that okay? Sarah, yeah, can we proceed that way? Yeah, but that's great. That's yeah. great, and let me let me then lead by uh, encouraging all panelists to, to 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 ask questions and make comments relative to one another's presentations. But I'll 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 start out. Um, I I have uh, questions for 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 each of the other panelists, and I'll just I'll just choose one to begin. Um, uh, Jack. Um, uh, you gave us a great description of the uh, APPG for Eritrea. I understand from, from Hamti that it's one of the more successful APPGs uh, in Parliament. Uh, do you agree with that? And um, uh, if so, why? Why is the Eritrean APPG more successful than others? More energetic, whatever. Yeah, I think energetic might be the right word there. It is difficult to get successful dealing with Eritrea. Um, it's certainly one of the more active APPGs. Um, I'd say in the last couple of years, or certainly in the last year, the main thing has been drawing in people um, who had a broader interest. Now, of course, in the UK, we had an election towards the end of last year. And in fact, I think we only had two members of the APPG who didn't lose their seats. Um, by working across uh, with other APPGs and partnering with other groups in, uh, within Parliament, we're able to expand to, to roughly 15 officers now. Um, not all people who had previously been engaged with Eritrea but may have had some other interests or have um, participated in some way with the APPG. Um, so, I mean, 
Eritrea is towards the bottom of pretty much every human rights list. And that's really a way of drawing in people who are just generally interested in human rights. Um, now, success, again, is a very difficult uh, thing to quantify when you're dealing with Eritrea, and you're not going to get much. Um, one of the ways of finding success with Eritrea is really focusing on uh, British foreign policy and really the, the minutiae of the, the, the goings-on of the civil service here in Britain. For example, um, Britain did pay into this uh, road building project through the EU Trust Fund. Um, but by involving the former Minister for Africa on that, uh, and, and also another former Foreign Office Minister, both who were very committed to human rights, and uh, former Prime Minister Theresa May, one of her major commitments, both as Prime Minister, but also as Home Secretary, that was ending forced labour. And you've really got to hammer home the point that military service in Eritrea is forced labour, however you look at it. And uh, from speaking to former ministers, you know, this didn't, a lot of the policies that they're enacting haven't been raised to ministerial level. And you've really got to get the civil servants there and go, who signed this off? Who took into consideration this commitment to ending forced labour? Because um, that way they, they'd have to go against an existing government policy um, in order to try and support this. And so far, no one has come forward and said, I've signed off this policy. This is who's uh, responsible for this. And that's quite a good... It makes people hesitant before they go ahead in the future and sign things off, because they may think it would be damaging for their career. Um, they're dragged out and said, well, this is the person who signed off this policy against uh, an existing government commitment. Uh, Hobti, let me, let me, thanks, thanks, Sharon. Hobti, let me ask you the similar question with an, with an add-on question. And, and I, I think you'll see in all of my questions and comments, try, trying to get for the benefit of, of, the, of the whole group here, how some of these, these things work on a human scale, what, what some individuals do um, uh, that makes things happen. Um, uh, so, for example, for the a APPG in Eritrea, are there one or two people who really make it work? How were those people cultivated? I know that, uh, Hapti, I know you have some particular champions in Parliament. Um, uh, it's up to you if you want to name their names. Uh, how did you come to, to develop those friendships? Did they find you? Did you find them? Was it just pure luck or was it strategic? And how did you figure it out? Well, it probably is a combination of all those of the above, all of the uh, points you made. Uh, it's, you're right. It's absolutely critical to have a, uh, a champion or champions that are interested in particular causes. Uh, as an example, we have, and I, I don't think you would mind too much mentioning me, me mentioning his name, but Lord Alton of Liverpool, who is a, a committed Christian, uh, uh, has had a long involvement on religious freedom, uh, and has actively championed uh, campaign for uh, those who are uh, persecuted on religious grounds in Eritrea. So we have engaged on a regular basis with David Alden, and he has been instrumental, really, in terms of the uh, parliament questions and early day motions we have raised over the last two, maybe three years in Parliament, asking the government what specific action they will take in protecting religious schools in Eritrea. And that has actually made uh, the country uh, as uh, one of the uh, top uh, countries in persecuting religious uh, uh, groups and the minds of most MPs. Um, and they have also given us an opportunity to link with organizations in the United States, for example. Uh, last July, 
I attended a conference uh, at the invite of the State Department on religious persecution. To a large extent, that was facilitated, facilitated by David Alter. So having really an individual that is that has an interest in a specific area and really trying to engage them on that particular issue goes a long way to addressing the special uh, situation that there is in Eritrea. Similarly, on the extractive sector uh, uh, and trade, there are uh, individuals who are committed and have the background and the experience to help us bring the issues that are going uh, in slave-like uh, conditions in the extractive sector in Eritrea to the wider audience, not only in the UK, but beyond. So I, I entirely agree, engagement on an individual basis and identifying the skill uh, base of those individuals is, is absolutely critical and moving things forward. I don't know if let I can Sorry, let me comment for a moment. You mentioned Lord Alton. I want to make sure everybody understands who he is and the significance of him. Um, I don't know uh, uh, full details, but I know he's a life peer. Uh, he's, he's a lord in the House of Lords, I believe, uh, for life, not a hereditary peer, uh, because he's had a very distinguished career. Um, he was uh, active in, in a political party uh, that I think was a, I could be mistaken, sort of a centrist party, uh, but he has distinguished himself in the areas of human rights, including international religious freedom, among other things. Um, and uh, for us sitting in the U.S., uh, we, we, we admire and envy um, uh, 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 your having such a person as Lord, Lord Alton. Uh, we've tried to find such a person and have not succeeded, as John mentioned. Um, uh, he, he's, I've had the pleasure of corresponding with him briefly. He seems to be a remarkable guy. Um, I, I guess for all of us, uh, something we can think about and then, and then discuss in group. Uh, how do you find your Lord, Lord Alton? Um, uh, if there was a single thing to move a country's government, having a Lord Alton might be the thing. Hop to anything further or Jack anything further about how you find the Lord Alton, how others can find the Lord Alton. Well, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. Having a David Alton on your side is a huge, huge advantage. He has ways of opening doors, not only in the UK, but internationally. But in terms of David Alton's background, I think Jack is probably the best place to say a few words on that than, than I am. Over to you, Jack. Yeah, Lord Alton was a Liberal Democrat MP, um, Member of Parliament, and then he was elevated to the House of Lords as a cross-bench peer. Uh, there was a lot of internal party dynamics that went with that. Um, he's, been, he's a long-time activist on uh, religious freedom, and uh, he, he's on the... Um, National Relations and Defence Committee in the House of Law. Uh, how do you guess to Lord Alton? That's a difficult question, but um, I, I would say if you're trying to create one, look for someone with a safe seat, because these are the people who are going to be able to get more involved in foreign affairs. That's also something that's very convenient with the House of Lords is people don't have constituents, which frees up a lot of their time. Um, and then uh, campaigning for a long time with a clear message going to be the way to get someone uh, involved. Ideally, if they have a background in um, uh, international development, a humanitarian work, or like Lord Alton, uh, religious freedom. Um, as we try and rejuvenate the APPG after the last election, there are a few MPs that we have now who we hope will uh, take on uh, Lord David Alton's mantle down the line. Um, and through uh, keeping them involved with Eritrea over a very long period of time, 
hopefully it will become similar to uh, Lord Alton. It will become a habit. Anybody else on the panel have comments on this topic? before I pose something to uh, Seagal and Gary. Um, this is John, this is John. John, go ahead. Yeah, um, just a comment and, and, and maybe a question. As I mentioned um, in the United States, you know, we're, I won't say hampered by, but we're, we don't have the advantage of having uh, uh, significant diaspora groups uh, in, in the opposition, obviously, who uh, campaign um, within within the Congress. Uh, there are small flashes of this and so on, but I'm just wondering uh, if anyone has any suggestions how to rally the opposition groups, uh, you know, who frankly, traditionally, you know, down, down is IS, you know, that's, that's their message. And yeah, that's fine. But you know, what's the way forward and a way forward could include support from the US government in the event that it's needed with by the uh, any, any, uh, shall we say new government uh, opportunities or actually in place in Eritrea. So you know how how do we how do we um, uh, urge and 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 move the oppositionists to to understand the importance of this and not just to have meetings talking to themselves you know I, I don't mean to be too blunt but that that's what that's what I've seen uh, for the last fifteen years. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask that we hold that, that, that this part of the discussion be just among the panelists, and then we'll be very, very eager to hear the other people who've raised their hands. I see how Mariam and Thikre have raised their hands, but Jack, you have your hand. May I, Mike, may I briefly answer to John's question in yeah. terms of engagement of members of the opposition? Now, when we set up the APPG in March 2016, the lead figure we have was uh, 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 Glenis Kinnock, uh, um, Lady Kinnock, who is a wife of Neil Kinnock, the former leader of the Labour Party. Uh, and she w was also a politician in her, on her own in terms of representing uh, her constituents uh, in, in Parliament, the European Parliament. Um, and the benefit of having Glenis uh, when we started was she had an extensive network of contacts within Parliament, both on the opposition and in government. And through her and through the contacts she had, we were able to attract more people to join the 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 APPG for Eritrea. So it's really important to find somebody who has an interest on the subject matter, in this case, a situation in Eritrea, and then through them, try to sell what, you know, try to bring in new people to, uh, to, to, to join hands and create a bigger group and a much more effective group. That would be what I would suggest. So find the first person is always challenging, but if you can find one, then you're in. I see that a lot, a lot of hands are raised, um, and this is yeah. maybe the single biggest yeah. topic for, for group discussion. Uh, but if I may, I'd like to postpone the discussion of this point uh, for the larger group until we cover a few more things within the panel. Is that okay? Does that make sense, Sarah? Uh, you want to finish the panel first, and then yeah, I, the, I'd the like to finish one. with the the panel interacting with one another, and then we'll get to everybody discussing. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Then, yeah. Okay. Uh, Jack, your hand is raised. Do you have a brief comment on this topic? Yeah, uh, just responding to John's comment. Um, I wouldn't say that not having uh, concentrated diaspora groups would be a major problem. From my experience, um, the way politicians organize their office is they often have 
one constituency based office to deal with constituency problems and they'll have a team dealing with that and a, another parliamentary group um, who deal with more of the political side. Um, so you may not get much traction if you're just working through diaspora groups just because of the way politicians office, uh, offices are focused. Um, again, uh, we've spoken about, about religious freedom, particularly with Lord, but that's a really good way to go in the US. Uh, I, I mentioned before that I, I worked with for Amnesty International in Israel. There was a lot of interaction between Amnesty and evangelical Christian group when dealing with um, Eritrean refugees. And the religious freedom angle is a great way to go there. Um, the other thing that may be an option is um, working with the uh, the Black Caucus. Now, uh, at the moment, my inbox is full of emails from the Ethiopian embassy sending me lots of statements that uh, the Black Caucus is making on the, uh, the dam. Um, so I don't know if there's a way of perhaps engaging them on Eritrea. Certainly sim they do similar sorts of things with Ethiopia. That that was yeah, sure. We, 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 pers we pursued our African-American members of Congress leadership there. Uh, so far, um, uh, not much luck. We can talk more about that later. I want to I wanna bring in... Um, uh, Sigal and Garrett, uh, do, do you in Israel have champions in the Knesset? Um, I expect that you do. Um, how, how do you develop them? Uh, is it, um, is it, uh, uh, HRM that does it? Is it individuals who do it? Is it Garrett's organization? And Garrett, Forgive me, I think when you began speaking, you, you identified a, a separate organization that you do, that, that the Eritrean's grassroots does its advocacy with. Am I correct? And if so, can you give us the name of that organization again? Uh, now first of all, I'd like to make it clear, uh, we are working together with Sigal. Uh, I think she will, it's better that she will explain about the lobbying of the organization with the Knesset that they are doing for the advocacy of, of the refugee. But uh, in Israel, like what I explained to you before, there are like many political organizations. Some of them, they are based here in Israel. Some of them also like uh, all over the world. For example, I am a member of like the APDP, uh, like on a you know, political uh, ideology. There are like many kind of political movement. But the thing that I was, uh, emphasizing before is like uh, through the time of like the pandemic, the coronavirus uh, was starting. We established like a task force for this issue. This task force was including it, 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 the name of the that like task force is like you no know, temporary like task force for uh, coronavirus crisis, which is including from all the political. Um, uh, people who are involved in the politics, individual activists, also from the community leadership, like there is also a leadership for the, which is advocating for the refugees' rights. So we just create this leadership for this purpose, and the result was like the thing that I explained to you before. I see, and so similar, similar for you said, once a year you have a big protest at the uh, Eritrean embassy, I think, is that also a unique task force just for that, rather than part of a an ongoing organization? Uh, this is like one of the mission, like uh, especially when we start, like you know, to involve in, in the political issue, like in order, like to advocate, like for the you not know, to expose the regime in Eritrea, like the, all the people who are involving in a political parties. One of the things that we were uh, starting to do is like to make a demonstration like uh, in the Ertan embassy also like the events for example not only like in the Ertan embassy for example about the the refugees who were being like you no know, drowned in the Mediterranean Sea like we were celebrating every every year in order like you not know, to remind our people the suffering of our people we are doing many activities like for example Every year there is like independence, like celebra uh, celebration here in Israel. And 
there are refugees like us. They went in thousand. We were like, you know, uh, con we went there like to condemn them because they were like living here in Israel like as refugees. On the like on the suffering of the Eritreans who are like you know in prison in underground, so to expose them to condemn them, we do like many kind of uh, oh, oh, evidence for that. Oh, oh, okay. And just to clarify, and then I want to get back to Seagal and talk about the Knesset and the lobbying in the Knesset for the for the grassroots work that, that Eritreans in Israel are doing. Say, let, let's say there are thirty thousand Eritreans there now. If that's the current number. Mm -hmm. I gather there are many, many organizations, uh, some of them calling themselves or, or associated with political parties. Men, uh, there, there might be, what, dozens of different Eritrean organizations uh, in Israel. Is that correct? Yeah, and yeah. For yeah. Some, and for some of these activities, such as a, uh, 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 a protest at the Eritrean embassy, many of these organizations will come together. There will be a leader for that particular action and that's how it happens. Is that about right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like to mention some, like, you know, like we have like a member of like a NSF, there are member of like a, a one nation, like the member of like, a, how I call it, like a, it's in Tigrinya, like I don't know the abbreviation, a, like a, the part which is like about would had not like uh, United for Justice, something like that. Uh, like youth movement, like there are one nation movement, there are many political, maybe I'm so sorry if, if I didn't mention them, but when it comes like to, like to demonstration and everything, we come all together. We did it all Got together. It. Yeah. Got it, okay, thank you. Shigal, can you talk about lobbying in the Knesset? Yes, uh, well, for that, actually, uh, all the human rights organizations that deal with this issue are working together. We have one lobbyist that is, uh, we all of us, we work with this lobby, lobbyist who is working for us. And um, uh, she's the one uh, identifying the member of parliament that uh, we should approach. And she sets meeting for us, and uh, then we go and present the various issues that the various organizations deal with, um, according to what interests this specific member of parliament. Uh, during the years, uh, we had different uh, levels of, um, how shall I say, cooperation um, from uh, parliament uh, members. Um, it's not like usually you just approach those parliament members that you know will be more um, sympathetic to human rights issues. And the main, uh, the main issue is to educate them about both the situation in Eritrea and the situation of Eritreans in Israel. So that's like the main challenge with them. Uh, but uh, uh, when we try to influence uh, decision makers, we need to get to those uh, uh, members of parliament and ministers that are not uh, so sympathetic to human rights. And that, that is a, a major challenge for us that uh, we are trying to, to succeed. Two questions on that. First, you mentioned that you have a lobbyist. Is that a paid lobbyist, a professional lobbyist? Uh, well, it's a paid lobbyist, yes. Um, but uh, professional, she's coming from us. Like, she's a human rights activist. She used, she used to be the spokesperson of the Hotline for Refugees and Migrants before. So she's coming from our uh, human rights organizations. Uh, but yes, she is very professional. Well, that's great. And uh, to the point you just made about the challenge of uh, interesting people from who are not so sympathetic to the issue, do you find that there are people, you know, there are people who are pro-immigration, people who are anti-immigration, are there people in the middle? Are there many people in the middle? Or is, are things so polarized that there's just friends and enemies? Well, I don't want to say enemies. Friends and not yet friends. 
well, the, unfortunately, the vast majority of the parliament and the government is very much anti-immigration, unless, of course, we discuss Jewish immigration. Uh, but the vast majority of the parliament is against immigration in general. And unfortunately, I can even say that the vast majority of them don't see any difference between uh, work migrants and refugees. Like uh, so many of them have absolutely, they don't care at all that genuine refugees that uh, will be risking their lives by being sent back and, they have no problem sending them back to a life dangerous situation. And that's really upsetting. Do you think that's truly uh, their state of mind or is it what their constituents want to hear? Do they truly not understand the difference? Even if they do understand the difference, they don't care. They, they feel as if uh, like the, the main view is we are a very small country surrounded by enemies and therefore uh, we cannot accept these people even if their life is in danger. And that is extremely horrible for a state that uh, was established by people that their life was in danger. Uh I, I, I don't want to dominate this if other members of the panel want to speak at this point, but Gary, I have a, another question for you um, that occurred to John and me some years ago. Um, in the U.S., we have um, an activity that's known generally as community relations, community relations, uh, that um, interest groups, including ethnic and religious groups, uh, ad adopt. There are some very well-known and very successful um, uh, Eastern European community relations groups, for example, for Ukrainians and Poles, and very successful Jewish uh, uh, community relations groups. And they, uh, one of the main things they do is lobbying and uh, uh, trying to convince uh, the government to do things, but they do many other things, which uh, may be thought of as being an indirect approach to, to, to influence the government. They work with other groups, with other community relations groups, uh, to have, uh, do things together, uh, to choose issues that they have in common and work on them together, even if it's not about the main issue, uh, that they're concerned about. Um, they do public relations, uh, stay in front of the press to show the good side of their organization. Um, is there a concept of community relations for Eritreans in Israel? Uh, in other words, not, not just direct advocacy, but reaching out to other organizations and to community groups from, from other ethnicities or from the from the mainstream of Israeli society to, to, to become friends with them, uh, to put on a good face, to do public relations. Uh, yes, it's true. Uh, that's, that's was one of the mechanisms that we use it here in Israel. I, in my speech, I just told you like uh, we did, we organized a lot of demonstration against, uh, Holot against the deportation against the Rwanda Uganda. Uh, for this re uh, issue, like we w first of all, we work like hand in hand with the organization, like uh, local organizations, and we were approached also the Israeli community, especially who can be uh, sympathizer with us. For example, the Holocaust survivors. When, for example, I want I can give you like one of the examples, the Rwanda Uganda. There was. The government was just went until to the final point to deport us and also like to put us in prison, like to in order to go to Rwanda, Uganda, even though there was like a, the, the issue in the court. Through this like connection, we were being connected with the Israeli public. Like many people from the Holocaust survivors, from the group of Holocaust survivors, from the diplomats, from the pilots, from the doctors, just they come out like to the protests, there was like two big protests above 25,000 people were being involved, like all of, our, all of them that are Israelis. So by giving our stories, by giving our interviews, by also 
went to all local communities. Like with Segal, I went to many cities, like also many airtimes also went to different cities, speak directly with the Israel public. And then like we explained them the situation, like we tried to explain them also, like if we were being thrown out to Rwanda, to Rwanda, for example, where the country has genocide, genocide before uh, 20 years, and like what will be our life there, like in a place where there is no connection with Eritrea, that our life will be in danger. So people were coming out and being protest, and there were influenced. So uh, even if like also the court, in Eritrea, if the Isaiah says something, it was being implemented. People will be killed, people will be the, put in prison. That's also the mentality that we had in Israel. If the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, say something that we thought it will happen to us, but because of the lobbies, because of the local organizations, because of the people, things were taken to the court, and then the court, like, cancels the, the policy were being implemented by the government. We saw three, not like there was like Saronim prison was being cancelled, then in Holland was being cancelled, then Rwanda, Uganda policy was being cancelled. Also the 20% the deposit, like from our money were also being cancelled by the court. So this is all like, you know, from the support of the local, for, from the citizens, also the local uh, human rights organizations. So on this issue, we were being highly integrated. We saw also like the lobbying. That's like what I want to emphasize to John Stafford says. We, the Eritrean in diaspora, the opposition, that were being failed, like when we approached the UN, when we were approached the United States, when we approached the European community, we went like divided. We, were not, we are not going like united. This is like the thing that we need to do, like if we are united, then we can create the lobby and we can like take all the support that the regime is taking from Eritrea, that we can divert it to all the Eritrean refugees all our, around like Africa, all around of the world, and then we can influence the change in Eritrea. That's like what that we are missing in, in the Eritrean side. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for that good response. Um, we have, um, I think we're getting to the point where everybody can, can talk. I see all these hands raised about uh, probably about how to mobilize the community toward, toward these uh, advocacy efforts, but just maybe two more things, two or three more things. Jack, your hand is raised. Is there something you wanted to say? You're, you're muted, Jack. Uh, no, unmute? no, sorry, I, I just forgot to lower it. Oh, yeah. You're okay, good, thanks. John, uh, here's one for you. Uh, could you speak briefly about the article that appeared just um, last night? Uh, in the Guardian, uh, you need not give any more detail than, you know, some of it's confidential, but uh, it gives an example of the work of the America team because it, it was in just yesterday's international news in the Guardian. I thought it might be worth uh, mentioning it today. Yeah, it's, uh, th this is about the seven members of an Eritrean cycling team that... Uh, was football, in, sorry, football team. Yeah, so don't I wish. A football team that was um, in Uganda for a match late last year, and they, they decided not to go back. So uh, it was news, and they were in hiding for a while in, um, in Kampala. And, and then they, uh, we, we, we were contacted, and can, can we help? So we, we, we figured out uh, uh, a place for them to go that was rather remote. And so they were there for some months. And then um, uh, eventually, very recently, um, the opposition, I'm sorry, the, the loyalists had, had located them and um, uh, basically Lord lured one of the guys out of where they were living and they beat him up and, and knifed him. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, and, and so there's an issue around getting protection for them. And we've been, we've been lobbying with uh, UNHCR 
to to get in there. I mean, they had been involved in the begin very beginning and 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 really, you know, um, didn't have a solution at that point. And that's when we moved them to a different place. So that that's a big issue now. And there's the article in the Guardian that came out yesterday that um, is, uh, you know, covering some some of this. And uh, so, um, you know, hopefully the the additional attention to this will will get uh, attention to them one way or another. Protection. Uh, conceivably, even move, even moving them elsewhere. And I, I should say, I raised this point because the Guardian article specifically mentions the America team and, and one of our uh, senior members. So if you folks uh, look for that, you'll see it. Um, I do. Do any other panelists want to comment or question about other panelists' presentations before we open this up to everybody? Mike, what I would suggest now is open the floor for the delegates to ask questions. That would be, I think, the best thing to do. We have about uh, 40 minutes left of the allotted time. Yeah, uh, I think, I think that the, uh, we should give the floor to the public. Are we? All right. So I think the first person who has had his hands raised for a while uh, is Ayla Mariam Tesfai. But before we start any questions, I would like to um, emphasize the, that uh, we should focus on post change, post change during, uh, you know, why. Uh, during transition time and beyond, yeah. So the because the conference is focused around transition, so can we focus on that? Can we be also uh, brief and uh, to the point? Thank you. So, uh, Haile Mariam, can you um, uh, open your mic and and ask your question, Doctor Sarah? Yes. Uh, uh, each each question you will have three minutes only, just to let them know. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sarah. I, uh, uh, and thank you, all the panelists, uh, Mr. Uh, Michael Slotnik, uh, John Stauffer, and Jack Patterson, Gabriel Wetmeles, uh, Seagal, and also um, uh, uh, my friend Hart <laughs> Tawalde. The, you, you, are, you are amazing. The, the presentation was uh, excellent. I, I benefited a lot. I'm uh, very impressed about the work uh, Focus uh, is doing. Uh, it has been a year uh, since we, uh, uh, we met. Uh, I, by the way, I'm from ENCDC. It's a political wing, so it's a, it's a different uh, creature here. Uh, I... Uh, uh, I will have time tomorrow, so I just uh, want to thank you, and uh, I want also to uh, support the uh, John Stuffer's uh, 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 expression that we are only talking to ourselves, especially the past three years with uh, uh, Trump in in in, uh, in the White House, we were not able to do anything, but uh, it's acknowledged. Uh, we will work together. And I want to thank everyone. And I think I will have my time tomorrow. We'll have a meeting for of the political organizations now. We'll have good news tomorrow. And I really want to thank you. I'm, I'm leaving the session now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Ato um, Araya Devesai. If we, could, if we take three questions and then um, then we will leave the panel to answer questions. So, uh, Ator Aya Devesai. Um, okay. Professor, sorry. Uh, thank you so much. I have to admit that I was deeply touched by this heartwarming reports uh, coming from all the three groups, you know, the Focus Eritrea group, and Hapte and Jack. Uh, uh, also, the American group, you know, Michael and John, and then the, three, the Israeli group, you know, Sigil and Gurewet. 
it just amazes me you know, how few dedicated individuals can make such a significant difference. And what also touches me is that we Eritreans are so blessed that we have friends of Eritrea. Keep in mind, you know, the people who have reported to us this morning, they are not Eritreans except few. And so really, to me, you know, that is something we should cherish. Now, my question to, to John, I think you raised an important issue with regard to the, the Eritrean justice seekers in the US, you know, uh, to what the extent to what we can do to make an influence, to support your activities, particularly this time when we have the presidential elections in the US, you know, what do you suggest the Eritreans as a group? Because now, luckily, you know, we have the Yaakil movement of North America uh, that is really a group uh, already organized in a countrywide with leadership. I'm sure Fekre is here today, one of them uh, can do. Plus also, if you remember recently, we have this uh, group of Eritrean professionals and scholars that have already established what we call the Eritrean Institute of Research, Strategy, uh, Policy and Strategy. That is also in the process of forming think tank groups who could be deployed you know, in several activities, one of which would be lobbying. You know? And so I was wondering what you think we can do. Plus also, I want you to address the issue of what is the risk? You know, uh, there may be the inclination to support Biden and hope he is the one who is going to be the winner in this election. But supposing we support Biden and if he doesn't win, is there a risk that we'll be running? Uh, so I wonder if you can share us some, some information on this. Sorry, I was, my video was off. You know. Well, I can I can start with comments, and maybe maybe Mike would add some, but um, and and and, I, and I'm I'm taking it that you're basically focused on asylum seekers in the United States and and the situation there, uh, and of course the background is that with this current uh, administration under Trump, things have gone completely uh, afoul, you know. Uh, things have affected uh, everything from the policy about who's allowed in and what, you know, what, what, what bars, what are bars against uh, uh, asylum. Uh, those bars have been raised um, and on and on and on. And, you know, and even spreading over to resettlement of, 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 of uh, uh, refugees, that that has been demolished as well. So they're just, you know, the opportunities are just dropping, uh, you know, uh, month by month almost. Uh, so, uh, and of course, uh, what uh, Dr. Devasai is referring to is that, you know, with uh, the, the possibility of a um, uh, shall we say a more understanding administration? Things could change. And uh, to answer your question, you know, I, I just can't, I could not accept or believe that there would be any downside uh, to you know your your uh, campaigning and so forth, uh, you know, politically in the United States and stuff. So you know, I think you need to, to do what you think you need to do, um, but the what what could be done now is is you've got to see your members of congress okay so it, it's a matter of priming the pump and, and just keep the message there nothing's going to happen overnight we know that for sure but if if you can get for example just small groups of eritreans uh to to uh, visit their own congressman's office or congresswoman's office uh, and usually you see staff people instead of the actual congressperson. But the idea is to uh, express the facts of, of what's going on 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis Eritreans who are looking for protection. And the idea is that, you know, okay, uh, th things are not, uh, you know, going to happen immediately. But uh, if there indeed there is a change, uh, you know, in the political balance, and it could be a huge change, we're not sure, we don't know, obviously. But, you know, if the Senate flips and the administration changes parties, I mean, you, you know, you've got a completely different ballgame. Um, so the idea is to make the people who are um, in Congress now, and senators too, not only Cong members of the House of Representatives, is to make appointments and, and get in there with several Eritreans who are in the constituency uh, who, who potentially vote for these people, the individual uh, in Congress, and tell them what's going on. And that, that, that the U.S. has no business forcing uh, any Eritrean to return uh, mm -hmm. to, to Eritrea uh, and, and until at least until it can be proven to be safe to do so. And, and we certainly hope that day will be coming. So that that's that's my response uh, uh, to to your to your thought, and and maybe Michael add something. Well, Thank I you, no, that 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 that's great. And to be clear, and I think everyone understands this, uh, the America Team is a nonpartisan organization. Uh, we don't support one candidate over another. We we uh, advocate on an issue basis, and we'll talk to anyone from any party and. Uh, 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 and we're happy to get results from anybody. As individuals, of course, we, we may be involved uh, uh, in political uh, efforts for one party or one individual or another, but the organization itself is nonpartisan. Okay, hopefully my mic is working. Um, it is very clear. Yes, very good. Yeah, um, I would like... Uh, uh, commend all the presenters for wonderful and insightful presentations and reflections, in particular to those uh, friends of Eritrea um, for their valuable works to help uh, Eritrean refugees. Um, well, uh, one of the, the concerns that I have is whatever we do, um, um, the, the kind of work that we can um, or the problem that we can solve is uh, um, is not that 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 big solution to the quagmire that Eritrea finds itself. Um, and one of the key um, um, issues that we have to address is um, the disunity among the Eritrean communities in diaspora. Um, and I would. Uh, like if the presenters can reflect on that, how we can unite the different uh, communities or the, the divided uh, communities in the diaspora. Um, and and uh, one of the things that they reflected, for example, the community relationship uh, is, is great. For example, uh, the Eritrean case is, is, is subset of the, the African case, for example. If you can communicate or make some um, relationship to African communities or um, other communities for that matter, well, we can have um, the minimum size that can influence politics in our host countries. Uh, but we are divided and we, we, we have that problem for us even before we, we, we reach to other communities, we have to uh, solve our problems. And um, uh, that, that's one of the things that I, I, I always uh, uh, consider solving. So that means we have to look inside. So we have to solve our problems and then we can ask help from others. So the, the, the key, for example, I, I live in the United States and I also involved in politics the, of course, no, um, for some time now. And, uh, uh, wh whenever we go to, to the American um, uh, um, government for, for, for help, the first thing that they ask is, well, what, what are the people? What are your supporters? And, so, and they send their people to demonstration uh, organized by, by the regime, and they see huge support. 
so uh, and, and that's our problem actually uh, so um uh, can the presenters reflect on that how we can mobilize our people in the diaspora so that we can have a minimum size that means this effective size that can influence palace makers in our host countries and also we can be viable uh, friends to other communities so that we can organize ourselves around that and then we can um, uh, uh, be effective the other thing is um my um um my observation is that the american foreign policy is decided at the regional level at at, at most so the people who are in in the african desk and others so it doesn't go up to uh, congress or um, high level in the american government so uh, and 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 can you can you reflect on that as well how we can operate this one if that is the case um and but i just raised my hand to thank all of you because we are we are doing a wonderful job because the immediate uh, solution to um, the Eritrean that fully Eritrea is to support them in the host countries or um, during their transition from their the refugee uh, or the refugee countries to the third, third, third country for resettlement and uh, um, John um, uh, referred this uh, um, the group um, hiding and, and that's 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 as great actually that this uh, is very touching and I hope uh, uh, this uh, will be solved for the better and uh, let's support this effort as well. Thank you very much. Sarah, so, can I are... come in on the first question? Sarah, may, may I answer the first question from, from Gabre in terms of uh, how best one can bring uh, the diverse Eritrean communities together? Uh, as you will know, that is the topic for tomorrow, how members of the diaspora can work together. But the question you ask is absolutely critical. And I sometimes wonder if our first problem to the situation we find ourselves in as a nation is whether it is Isaias or the disunity amongst us. Sometimes I think it's a latter. In fact, most of the time, it is probably the, the, the latter. The disunity we have amongst our Eritrean community is what is actually sustaining the regime in Asmara. Eritrea opposition groups represent the biggest or the largest opposition groups per capita in the world. Almost every 100,000 uh, Eritreans, whether be it in the country or in diaspora, can claim to some sort of a, a political organization. And that is mad. It's a nightmare. Yeah, I can accept, and, you know, and most people would, that a small country like ours would have, at the very most, half a dozen political organizations, yeah? Maybe less, in fact. But the fact that we have so many opposition groups makes it extremely difficult to actually engage with the international community. They don't know who is who, yeah? You visit foreign offices or the you know, State Department, as you say, and you're asked, oh, who do you represent? And even if you were to tell them one political party's name, they probably wouldn't recognize it. So that is a big challenge. The issue is that how do you overcome it? I think the legacy we've inherited from the struggle is one of our other problems. Yeah? I must confess I've never been in the struggle. Yeah? I left my homeland as a child. I've always, for most of my adult life, lived outside Eritrea. But whenever you talk to Eritreans, this constant notion of Isaias, EPLF, ELF, actually drives you around the bend. 
You know, there are more important issues than ELF, MEPLF, ECIS, and all that. Our country is at stake. There was a good saying, Haile Selassie keep, kept on repeating. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of Haile Selassie, but he repeatedly said, religion is private, it's an individual issue. Yeah, but a country belongs to all of us. Eritrea belongs to nobody else, but to the whole of the Eritrean people. And until, and, and, until we actually recognize and take that as really the driving force for our unity, I really can't see how we can unite. There is a lot of individualistic attitude. Yeah? And I dare say that people who actually were members of the struggle are probably now becoming the problem of our unity. Yeah? That will sound controversial. Yeah? We need young people to come up the stream for us to begin to create a new Eritrea, a country at peace with itself, a country at peace with its, with its neighbors. And the people we have, I'm afraid, in opposition now, in my view, who are in most cases in their 70s or even older, are really not fit to govern the young generation. They can advise them, they can guide them, of course they would. But we need young blood to actually bring us together. And the Yaku movement is where I have my hope. Yeah? And where we in Eritrea Focus are actively trying to work to help them in any way we can. We can advise them, but they should lead. And that would be my answer to you, Devre, to what is a critical and more important question than Isaias himself. You know, how, you know, how do you bring change? Thank you. Okay, go ahead, make a, Yeah, just uh, commenting on, you know, uh, and, and this would be sort of in the context with the U.S. government, but it could be uh, virtually any other uh, Western uh, democracy. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think there's a danger of what we're about of trying to make it everything perfect in, in the sense that, uh, well, you know, we have different people talking to the government, you know, whether they're uh, EPDP or whether it's uh, ENSF, Hidru, or whoever. Um, and, and certainly their, their uh, stridency or their message might be a bit different one to another. But to me, the, the main thing is to create the awareness. The basics of the message have to be heard by whoever, the State Department, the various congressmen, senators, the White House, the, the overall message that, um, that for one thing, uh, if and when there is change uh, in the governance of Eritrea and there are needs, that the U.S. should step in making available help immediately. You know, whether, it, it, whether, it's, it, whether it's food or whether it's whatever, um, uh, training and, and a lot of the other stuff you know, that's been discussed, uh, you know, like last, la last year. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, my, my concern is that we, we might get bogged down in, in saying, uh, the message, you know, I don't care who delivers the message as long as it's essentially the same, you know, that, that what's going on in Eritrea and, and it really has got to stop and, 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 and asylum seekers have, have valid claims and, and they, they should be protected and, and on and on. You know the basic message. And however we can deliver that uh, in a credible fashion, uh, and again, it could, be, it could be the Africa Bureau, the State Department, you know, it, 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 it could be to the uh, religious freedom section of, of the State Department, it could be to a congressman, uh, could be to the um, Human Rights uh, Council um, uh, or, or the um, was it Lantos Commission, I should say, in the U.S. government 
and 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 of course it could extend to messages to the UN. So that that would that would be my my uh, suggestion. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, can we all be uh, as brief uh, as possible because we have quite. Um, many people who have raised their hands so that everyone can have a chance. Can we all, uh, all be, be, uh, be brief? Um, I think the next is uh, Martin Plot. Martin, you've raised your hand. You can unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Yes, I will be brief. Um, three quick points. First of all, uh, I completely agree with what John and Mike said. It is self-activity. Uh, I do not understand why Eritreans have stood by and not become engaged when you see, for example, in the Britain, the Asian community being really dynamically engaged in the political process. Any of you can become involved. I know that you have many pressures on your time, but it is really up to you to choose to, to engage with the political process. Uh, as John said, you can go and lobby. It doesn't matter how you lobby but don't stand idly by and talk to each other. The internal debate has gone on for 30 years and produced next to nothing. Why don't you try the external debate? So, uh, you know, that's my first point. Second point, very briefly, I think that it is vital that this engagement across um, the, uh, the ocean, shall we say, continues. I think we should establish a way of um, John, Mike, um, Sigal and Gebre to and ourselves to come together on a regular monthly basis to so that we share the information, share our views, and that I propose that we, we actually establish as a point uh, that we will and we can decide the time. It's up to people whether they want to join. My third one is that we have here in this meeting Clara Smith, who represents an organization which is at least as effective as the as ourselves in Eritrea for focus on the others. May I appeal to you, Sarah, to allow her to speak because she really represents a powerful organization in the, in the Netherlands. They've been doing at least as much work as any of us. So could I ask you to give her the floor? Thank you. Uh, 